Uh, so you're here watching a mouthful of mayhem, taste test and gut response to salsa, guac, and supply chains plat du jour. I was thinking about this, uh, getting ready for the talk, and I remembered about five or six years ago when I was sitting with a colleague of mine named Andy, and we were investigating yet another image magic vulnerability, which has been a recurring theme throughout my entire career. And I said to him, we should write something. We should try to graph all of the dependencies of all of our Docker images, and we could see exactly what dependencies are in each of our containers. So the next time we get one of these vulnerabilities, right away we'll know what we need to patch and what we need to stop admitting. And he responded that if I could do that, I should go do that instead of working there. Um, so we put together a little utility that would analyze the layers of those Docker images. We did it more as an experiment than anything. We decided it was way too much work to commit to at the time, and we put it aside. I have not returned to it since. Um, that was kind of the amuse-bouche on my supply chain journey. And today, of course, it's a really popular topic. There are a lot of full-featured options available. And in fact, there's a whole buffet. There's dozens of entrees, appetizers galore. It's hard for me to keep track of all of the things that are coming out in the supply chain ecosystem now and exactly how they all fit together. And so I thought if it's hard for me to keep track of the plates being served, it's probably difficult for some of the other people here too. I hope that throughout this, we can identify what some of those things are and figure out how we can put them together. Um, as you've probably gathered, my name is Shane. Uh, that is my face, that is not my hat. I work for a company called Shopify, and for the last seven years, I've been on the infrastructure security team there. Um, mostly I'm building a platform for developers to make e-commerce go burr, and my job pulls me in a number of different directions to do that. Sometimes it's threat detection, sometimes it's threat modeling, um, but the main thing that I try to focus on is automating the toil. Uh, I wanna make sure that it's as easy as possible for developers to deploy a secure product with the absolute minimum friction possible. I've found over and over and over again throughout my career that if I make it easier for them to do something securely, they'll just do it. And some of them are really interested in learning how that works, and that's awesome, that makes me happy. Some of them don't care at all, and, and that's okay because they're still getting the, the sort of fruits of my labor. They're still getting a secure product without needing to learn how to configure all of the bits to do that. Supply chain is part of my job. It is not what I spend most of my time in, but I think most people in a security conference like this will agree that you can't completely avoid it anymore. Uh, with a number of recent events, it's just impossible to stay away from this completely. You kind of have to learn a little bit about it, even if it's adjacent or far away from your specialty. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of interested whenever I talk to other people what whet their appetite for supply chain. Uh, these are some of the highlights for me that led to my current interest in it. And the, the first one, solar winds, I mean, that was kind of, uh, it's hard to overstate how potentially devastating that would have been. The impact is pretty well incalculable. And most of all, though, I think it's possible that solar winds was a net positive for security, even though it was a really devastating problem. And that's because it just drew so much attention. And now almost everyone seems to be paying attention to it. It led to this executive order from the president about cybersecurity. Uh, and that kind of spun off this, this wave of people creating companies, creating products, and creating lots and lots of policies for dealing with the supply chain problem, figuring out what's in it, figuring out how to respond when something goes wrong. Uh, that doesn't mean that we've you know, eliminated the problem. Since then, we've seen CodeCov, where people who are using this, uh, this tool for evaluating how much of your code is actually covered by your test cases and really shouldn't have been affected by a, a real security problem. But one of the things that a particular part of CodeCov did is you run it in your build environment and it runs a remote script. And somebody got a hold of that and intercepted it, and instead of going and talking to the real CodeCov servers, it went and talked to a malicious command and control server. And what that did is said, hey, whatever build system connected to me, just dump all your environment variables and send them to me, and that's, that's 
probably something that a lot of people do normally in their build environment is look at environment variables. They probably pull secrets from them to do a variety of tasks. I wish they didn't, but it's very, very common as we saw in the aftermath of this attack. And so the people who did this got secrets, uh, they got tokens, they got source code, they got a lot of information, and it was, it was, I think, one line. It was pretty straightforward, but if you didn't know you were running this or if you didn't bother to check that the thing on the other end hadn't changed, you would have no idea that all of this had just been stolen. And I'm uh, almost surprised that I haven't heard more in the last couple days about XZ um, or X said, I, I'm from Canada, I can't not say Z. Um, XZ utils, it was the result of a multi years long campaign to become a trusted maintainer of something that's used almost everywhere. And it's really only thanks to the efforts of uh, one really, really dedicated individual who realized that it was just, it was using a little bit more CPU cycles than it should have uh, that prevented this from being a real catastrophe because this is used as a dependency in almost everything. And we're very, very lucky that it was caught when it was because this was well obfuscated, and in fact, some of the obfuscation is what led to its detection. They almost did too good of a job of preventing the actual code from being seen. Um, but I think we're gonna see more and more of this. The reason that we don't, in my opinion, is for one, it's hard to detect, and for another, it takes a lot of resources and was sort of an untested pattern, or at least an unknown pattern until now. But I think especially with nation states and sophisticated actors, we're gonna see a lot more of the XZUtils style of attack because they can put the effort into it. And once they're in there, once they're a trusted maintainer, they don't really need to do all that much other than just merge Dependabot PRs and make sure that they're still active enough that they don't get booted out of that repo. Um, one thing that I, I neglected to show on this timeline though that really did get me more interested in supply chain security was all the cool kids from Fang wrote blogs about the importance of supply chain and then immediately left to build supply chain companies and there's some really cool stuff out there now. Another thing that got me interested in supply chain security is someone I really look up to, Ken Thompson, who's like the Julia Child of supply chain security. Um, he was a machine, he created B. He helped invent C, the language. He helped create Go. He came up with the name Unix. And he originally, has anyone here used grep before? I, I think probably a lot of people who are familiar with Linux have used grep. Uh, he wrote that as a personal utility for himself to work with text files. Um, and one thing that Ken Thompson said is, you can't trust code that you did not totally create yourself, especially code from companies that employ people like me. And that was in a, a document called Reflections on Trusting Trust. And that was in 1984. That was a very long time ago. So he was way ahead of us. Um, looking at this, I like to reflect on it and think if you don't have a single package dependency, you still have to trust the compiler. You still have to trust the kernel that you're running on. And we've seen with things like Spectre and Meltdown, these predictive execution attacks and a number of side channels. More recently, there was one called Reptar. Um, with all of that, I would say you also can't trust the hardware that the software is running on. So uh, this is a quote, you can use that. Um, I think we can shorten this to just, you can't trust code. Now, don't take my word for it. There's a ton of research that supports this idea that the supply chain problem is getting worse. This is from a Sonatype report and that was the ninth annual state of the software supply chain. So you can see just this massive, massive increase in the number of malicious packages that have been discovered. And once again, this is discovered. So we can consider that there's probably a confounding variable that all of the attention on supply chain problems has probably ex exacerbated that because we're just finding more of them now, but that doesn't explain the whole thing. That doesn't explain the, the mountain on the right side of that graph. There are a lot of problems, and even though the, the sort of white hats, the people who are trying to protect our organizations, protect our software, and improve the ecosystem, are aware of this more now, and they're doing more about it, it also makes it very clear to every script kitty, every less sophisticated attacker, they can see that this is working. They can see, wow, look at the lucrative targets that I can get if I just go uh, you know, pull a left pad and, and change some of my own source code. 
I like to find out what the grown-ups are doing about this. And, and when I started looking into this problem, there wasn't a whole lot out there. There's a lot now. Uh, government departments, big companies, they are releasing a lot of information about you know, guidance, what you should do about this. So one, one such grown-up document is uh, NIST Special Publication 800-161 Revision 1 Cybersecurity Supply Chain Risk Management. And in my head, I, I read this acronym as CSCREAM. I don't know how you pronounce that, but uh, this is 326 pages of organic NISTy goodness. And so if building secure and reliable systems, uh, a document that I really like, is your favorite recipe, then this NIST publication is like actuarial guidance for insurance adjusters estimating the likelihood of a kitchen fire. It's dry. It's emphasizing risk management and how to make this a part of a traditional business process around quality control. Uh, so it's very heavy on classification. It's very heavy on procedures. It's also, it's actually pretty useful. I think a lot of the advice in here is, is good to bring up to a board of directors or someone who's really focused on managing risk, uh, someone with that kind of large corporation mindset. Um, not, not ideal for me. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, in the end of last year, we saw more guidance, things like securing the software supply chain, recommended practices for software bill of materials consumption. Um, and I worked in a sort of public sector cybersecurity environment before, and so this kind of style of writing is familiar to me. It's, it's basically an eat your veggies document wrapped in the footnotes and grayish language of the bureaucracy. And my favorite quote from this, those are actually the first words in this document are, cyber attacks are conducted via cyberspace. So that's uh, really helpful. Thank you to the NSA for that uh, enlightening a little bit. Um, we're getting a little closer now. So this is a Gartner report. Uh, it's, it's not quite where I would like to be, but it's getting a little bit more terse. It's getting a bit more useful. And I actually had an opportunity last year in Chicago to participate in an industry panel. And that was a really cool experience for me because it was very, very different from my day-to-day -day work at Shopify. But it is pretty close to the mindset of the people that I worked with at my previous job before that. It was a big consulting firm's MSSP. And so a lot of our, our clients were people in insurance companies and government agencies and things like that. Uh, but it was really interesting to see how some of the like fun tinkering style work that I do, or at least did some years ago at Shopify, is kind of getting distilled down now into these industry practices. And the grown-ups are recommending it to their friends and suggesting that, like, hey, yeah, we should, we should see what's in our build system. Um, there's one thing that really stands out here to me, and it's this quote. Uh, they actually repeat it four times in what is a pretty short report, and that is, the inability or unwillingness of a vendor to provide an SBOM should be viewed as a significant risk and potentially disqualifying. And that's probably a little bit controversial. There are some people that I look up to who uh, will not sing the praises, shall we say, of an SBOM. They've got a lot of negative things to say about them because just like any other text file, it is completely useless if you don't use it. Uh, but I do think that this kind of advice is a step towards transparency, and I think that's a positive thing. But we're not here to hear that. Uh, if you want me to soothe you to sleep with those 362 pages of the NIST report, then we're going to need a much longer session. So instead, I want to talk about how we should solve this problem. I think we should take a look at the recipes, the guides, the ingredients, and the dishes available to us. I think that there may be some things in there that taste great on their own, but we need to make sure that they're complementary when we put them all together. If we serve our users, so, sorry, our guests, a meat smoothie, they're not going to thank us. They will not consider how good these things might have been individually. If we want them to embrace security, we have to make it palatable for them. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to figure out what's in our dish. As anyone with a peanut allergy will tell you, it's really important to know what's in the food. If you ask the kitchen what's in the food and they can't confidently tell you, they're not going to trust you to prepare their meal. We need to know that what they say is in our food is really in there, and it has to be confirmed by someone we trust. And we need to know that sometimes even trusted parties are going to make mistakes. They're going to encounter circumstances that are beyond their control. So we also need a sort of recall list that we can use when they realize that, whoops, royal milk accidentally put lead in all of their baby formula. Um, we need to know that what we're dealing with was made safely, and we can see that with something like a kitchen health inspection certificate. This is where we take a highly trusted third party, the health department, and they promise that they're going to tell us that what's delivered is what we ordered. 
Um, we also have sort of the cryptographic equivalent of an Uber Eats driver putting a sticker over the lid. And it kind of solves the problem, but it tastes like glue. Uh, our users don't want to look at hashes all the time. They don't want to look at the cryptographic proof that this is what they ordered. So we need to come up with a, a better user experience, a way that we can just simply and straightforwardly put it to them that this is what they asked for. And we also need to know uh, where our software is running or in the kitchen parlance, kind of which table did that plate go to or who got this particular dish. Um, as a sort of bit of an aside here, uh, I think there's a statement about society here when the ratings range from an upper bound of a very happy face through a minimum passing grade of a slightly smiling face. And then the worst possible rating here is just like a neutral expression. Um, so I, I think that if you repeatedly neglect basic hygiene and that threatens the health or even lives of your patrons and you get a neutral face there, we're probably not being strong enough in how we express ourselves. So I hope that we in cybersecurity will be more assertive when we say no to things than the folks in charge of trivial matters like our food supply. <clears throat> so we want to know that what's delivered is what we ordered. I talked a little bit about the hashes. This is what our users are going to see if we ask them to prove that the thing that they downloaded is really what they were asking for. Even just getting them to do this automatically is a bit of a problem. If we let them copy and paste the SHA, they're still only going to do it like maybe a slim majority of the time. Uh, this is the canonical way though, and to be clear, this is really, really important because it does solve part of the problem, but it doesn't verify what's in the container, only that it matches a string provided by someone. Maybe it was provided by us, maybe it was provided by the website of the software provider, maybe it's in the GitHub, and so if their software is compromised, who's to say that the hash that they have provided isn't also compromised? Um, it's prone to those issues, users don't like it, and another important part is that if you look at something like that, you don't immediately know what that corresponds to, what version is that, what software is that, who made it. And uh, it's also got a number of other problems when you're working with it, even if you are experienced with it. Uh, for instance, the index digest at the very top there is different from the one specified for Linux AMD 64. And so anyone who's worked with multi-arch images before will see that that's a problem if you're trying to specify that this is going to run on different platforms. You use the wrong, ambiguous, long string of characters that were generated at random, and you get the wrong result. You have no idea why. So this is a bad UX. And that's bad for security. Now, in our kitchen analogy, we wanted to be able to ask which table that plate went to. Uh, this is a sample image from a restaurant's front of house software. And that's, that's kind of for table management. They can see who's where and, and what they were supposed to get. Um, we want something like this for software. We want to be able to see who's running it where and what went out to it. Now that we've got an idea of what we want to prepare, we can see kind of what's available at the market, what resources are available at our disposal, and only then can we put a menu together. So the very first thing, salsa, it's not an individual ingredient, it's not a dish, it's more of a cookbook. It describes four levels of heat. It, it used to go from one to four, now it goes from zero to three. Uh, about two years ago in Valencia, I mentioned that I've never heard of anyone running level four, and as far as I can tell, it just doesn't even exist anymore. So we start off with zero, it's mild, there are no guarantees whatsoever. We work our way up to medium, where you know where your food came from. You get into the, the next level of spiciness, you get hot, and we're like, wow, okay, so we know where it came from, and we know that that was a trusted build server. And then our highest category currently in use today, our Pika Mucho is a well-configured build server that's trusted with good security policies, and that is our hardened build. So there's some tools out there. Salsa GitHub Generator is one, Salsa Verifier is another. But the whole idea is that you should be able to look at these frameworks, understand what it means to have good software supply chain security practices, and come up with a roadmap for step by step getting there. It's not going to tell you exactly what you need to do in your environment because it's meant for just about everybody, but it's very, very helpful. There's a different approach too. Uh, this one is a proprietary thing. Um, Tidelift came up with it. it call, it's called Tacos. Uh, food analogies are big in this, this world right now. But it, it uses an open source framework, but proprietary data. I feel uh, kind of conflicted. It's, it's like it's very tasty, but it could be a pain in the neck when you're using tacos. It's open source framework means that anybody can see how they're evaluating whether this open source project is abiding 
by what they would consider proper security policies. And they've got, as far as I can tell, this is a pretty novel approach where they just, they just give money to developers of open source software to follow good security practices. I'm very much in favor of giving open source developers money if you have a whole boatload of it. And so I'm very thankful to Tidelift for doing that. It feels a little odd, though, that the data is proprietary. And I think the, the interpretation of that that I would like to go with is just that they want to make sure that other corporations aren't just going to sort of mooch off of the fruits of their labor, as has happened with so many other open source efforts. And so this is kind of a way of protecting the process and making sure that they can continue to support open source developers. I don't know that to be true, but I hope it is. Um, we can get pretty close to making everything from scratch in our kitchen if we use minimal base images. And everything that we make is going to depend on these. So if we start with some gigantic Ubuntu image and it tastes off, it's going to ruin the whole thing. Um, Alpine is a good base image to start with. It eliminates the artificial sweeteners and the red dye that you would find in some of the bigger package dishes. Wolfie takes this even a step further. It's another free open source distro. Uh, it doesn't even have a kernel. It's, it's very, very minimal. Um, so it's very small, it's easy to download, and it aims for zero CVEs. So certainly you can use other Linux or whatever your favorite OS is based images. But the more that is in there, the more likely it is that one of those ingredients is going to cause a problem down the line. So I would certainly recommend using one of these two if they're suitable for your use case. Well, if it's a pretty cool idea, I'm looking at it more and more. Uh, no modern security talk would be complete if we didn't talk about S-bombs. And I really broke the theme with the graphics here. I'm sorry. I, you're probably wondering why I went with Mortal Kombat when Overcooked was right there, and that is just a personal flaw of mine where every single time I do a head-to-head -head comparison of two options, I immediately reach for this because I want to get more mileage out of the awesome Mortal Kombat fount that I downloaded. Uh, so I should have grabbed some of those Overcooked screenshots. Oh, well, next time. Um, S-bombs, this is like an ingredient list. They don't tell you how it was made, but they do tell you exactly what's in it. We need generators for this because if we write it down on a piece of paper by hand, that's great, but it could change multiple times per day, dozens of times even. In big environments, this might be changing 100 times an hour. So we need some automated way of producing this S-bomb, this list of ingredients, so that we know what's in it. And the, the reason that this is so important in software is like Alpine Latest just ain't what it used to be. The ingredients, not only of the things that we're producing changes, but also of what we're consuming. So if we're just pulling the latest tag, we need some easy way of seeing what's in there. Um, there's two formats, Cyclone DX and SPDX. Uh, I cannot figure out which one is better. I don't think there is a superior choice. It doesn't really matter. As long as you pick one that works with your tooling, that's probably the way to go. The bigger problem, in my opinion, than which format to use is that you can use the same format for everything and get completely different results based on almost exactly the same steps. So it's really good. You know it's in there, but it's very variable. There's an opportunity here uh, for me to give some advice on what should go into your SBOM. Um, this isn't expert advice, I guess. It's more of a personal preference, but I really don't think that vulnerabilities should go in here. And a lot of very smart people that I've talked to agree with that. And that's because it is important for people to know if there's a listeriosis recall on lettuce, but that doesn't mean that the ingredient list on the box is the right place for that information to go. So there's something new, uh, protobomb. This is pretty cool. When I first heard of it, I thought that this was the classic problem in tech of having N standards and declaring that the solution to this is to have N plus one standards. So that was my immediate fear when I heard about protobomb. It sounds like they're actually attempting to avoid this. They're not creating a third separate standard that will compete with the other two. Uh, this is actually an SBOM generator with pluggable parsers. So it's got a parser for Cyclone DX. It's got a parser for SPDX. It can read either one and decide based on what your needs are how to translate that, how to come up with the right output. So I think that's, that's a forward-looking way of adapting to this problem. I said I don't like the vulnerabilities in SBOMs. This is where I think they should go, and that is in public databases. So uh, NIST runs the national 
<coughs> excuse me, the National Vulnerability Database. That's the canonical standard. Uh, it's kind of like a legal policy now that you have to look at that, uh, which is a really big problem because it kind of went down for a while. It wasn't completely out, but for a couple of months this year, it was almost unqueryable, and a lot of the information that was in it was out of date. And if you can imagine a sort of analogy, if the FDA's recall list for contaminated food was just impossible to reach and couldn't be trusted for some months, it would really destroy a lot of faith in that. Fortunately, it looks like um, you know an open letter, a lot of attention from the community has brought more focus on the government side on keeping this up to date. They put out a contract. I don't know if it's been filled yet, but they, they are committed to coming up with a solution and making sure that this is well maintained going forward. It seems to be working for me lately, so that's good. There's also some alternatives. Uh, Google has OSV, or the Open Source Vulnerabilities Database, and they maintain it. It's fully open. And you can see it. Uh, we saw like the, the graph from Sonatype a few minutes ago where we saw how much of a problem this is and how much focus is on it. And so when you see all of a sudden there are a lot more things going into the database and a lot more people querying it, it seems almost um, like unavoidable that you're going to have an increase in resource requirements to run that. Government agencies aren't famous for their speed and adaptability, so I guess we can probably forgive this one, but it's it's still pretty disappointing that that happened. All right, so we've got an idea of what we want to be able to accomplish. We know about a few things that can guide us for how to do that, so we want to know what the ingredients are that we can work with now. Um, artifacts are something that we need to be able to keep track of. These aren't ancient pottery fragments or the remains of a long lost scarum production facility. These are binaries and attestations. SIGSTORE is a really, really great tool that gives us a trustworthy way to attest what our diners are getting is what we said we were making. And itself is composed of different parts. Uh, cosine, as you can probably imagine, does the signing. Fulkio, no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly, issues code signing certs based on OIDC verification. So in short, this says that when Shane at Lawrence.dev logs in and signs this commit, it really is me who's doing that. Now, most of us would rather wash dishes than run our own PKI, so I'm extremely happy that this exists here. And then we also have Wrecker, which is a write-only or append-only log of all of the things that were sent to it. So this means that when I do that attestation that this really was written by me, and Falkio says, yes, that really was Shane, then Wrecker records that no one can ever change that. It's there forever, it's publicly queryable, everyone can see, yes, that was me who signed that. And policy controller is another important piece. We'll come to that a little bit later. But this is a really great example, in my opinion. SIG store shows how complementary ingredients coming together create a nice dish that tastes just right. Intoto is another really useful tool. It's a technique for showing what our recipe was, not just our ingredients, but our recipe, and proving that we actually followed it. And actually, one of the artifacts that we can put back into SIG store is our Intoto attestations. And this is where we start to get what I was talking at the beginning of this talk about, which is this queryable dependency graph, the thing that my colleague and I wished we had years ago, but just didn't exist. Um, so in addition to being the highest possible achievement for an avocado, Guac is the graph for understanding artifact composition. It's an open SSF incubating project. And it can tell you if you have a specific dependency somewhere in your environment. And this is actually a very difficult problem because of transitive dependencies. So you might think that you don't use log4j, but when you use tools like this and analyze the yes bombs in the available vulnerability databases, you can put that information together to find out that actually you might not be using it, but a thing that you use does, or a thing that you use uses a thing that uses a thing that uses log4j. And, and this can be very, very tricky to track down if you don't have a good tool for doing it. Um, a uh, person that I used to work with at Shopify, Jacques Chester, was actually uh, someone who came up with a lot of the advice that went into the creation of this. And he's got a blog post called The Universal Graph that I think is pretty good. Um, the GraphQL API that Guac uses also makes it possible that you can integrate this with your other tooling or build on top of it. So if you've got, as is the case for me at my day job, uh, a proprietary tool just for us to see what we're deploying in different places, the API would give us the ability to integrate that into our existing tooling. And instead of just running the command line queries, we could actually have it automated so it would go out and tell us what's running where. 
Uh, we want to be able to do enforcement. That can be pretty tricky. There's binary authorization, and that is part of the Google Cloud smorgasbord for, for trying to do supply chain things. Uh, there's also Caverno, and the one that I mentioned that's part of SigStore is Policy Controller. And that one, it's not as full featured as Caverno or OPA, but it's a pretty good option if what you're trying to do is just make sure that all of the things you're deploying actually were signed and attested to by Cosign and all of the other ingredients that went along with it. Uh, OPA and Caverno are not strictly for supply chain, but they do support policies based on your artifact registry or your container registry, and you can add custom labels using your own tooling that OPA and Caverno can then action. So basically, this makes sure that only your signed packages get in, only the things that have trusted ingredients are able to go out the door. Uh, please forgive me, I promise this is the only AI-generated image in this talk. I really, really wanted to mention, though, how important it is that you focus on the developers, the users, the people who are actually going to be producing things of business value with whatever it is that you're building or trying to secure. So if the devs who use your software are expected to memorize the super-duper secure version of the SHA for whatever package you want them to use, then they're probably not going to do it, especially when a brand new CVE drops and they have to memorize a new SHA and go find that every time. So I talk a lot about enforcement. That's probably good, but I would love to hear more from other people about enablement. I want to make sure that when you do something that is insecure, it's a little bit harder than it needs to be. When you're doing something that is very, very insecure, that it's almost impossible. And I want to make sure above all else that doing things the secure way is very, very easy for your users. So we want to prevent them from doing the really scary stuff, but we want to make it as easy as possible for them to do things in a way that's going to be secure. And I think this is absolutely the best way to protect not just your own organization, but the people who rely on it. So at, at my job, that's our merchants and the people who are buying things on our platform. But everybody here is the end user for somebody else's product. So if we can make sure that this is something that can be achieved without a lot of friction, then it's going to be better for all of us. Um, I think it would be negligent almost if I didn't mention some of the paid options. None of the people here write my paychecks. I don't pay any of their invoices. I have recommended some of them in the past, though. And I know some great people who work at all of these companies. So they're not the only ones offering these services, but I did want to highlight some of them. Um, not every dining room is going to serve the confit de canard from scratch. Some kitchens are just going to warm up whatever Cisco or Gordon Food Service brings. But that's probably an unfair comparison for some of these companies, but I hope you get the point. Uh, ChainGuard has ChainGuard Enforce, which is keyless signing and managed setup and private signing. Google Software Delivery Shield, I looked into this a bit, trying to figure out what it is specifically, and it's not an individual dish. It's like a smorgasbord of all these different GCP offerings, and if you cram them together in just the right way, then you will ostensibly have supply chain security, and if you have an unlimited budget, you can probably pay them for as much of these different features as you want. I wanted to compare that to AWS supply chain uh, just for the sake of balance and very quickly realized that these are not the same thing. I'm not saying it's a bad product, but that is for managing like warehouses and stuff. So this is not equivalent. Don't use that for securing your software supply chain. Uh, CloudSmith is another one. It proxies your upstream repos. It hosts your images, scans your images, and lets you create policies so that if people are using your CloudSmith repos, then they can only download the images you want them to under the right circumstances. So you get a little bit of policy enforcement there. And then Aqua, uh, this one, okay. This is a cloud-native application protection platform. I'm starting to think that we're just trying to sell the governments with all of these acronyms. Uh, they were pretty early in this space, so they were kind of like OGs in the cloud security space. So it's cool to see that they still have offerings, that they're still adapting and doing well. And then Wiz is a really cool brand with a CSPM, a Cloud Security Posture Management, which is an abbreviation that just demonstrates how very grown up and mature cloud is now. Uh, this one can use SBOMs as an input to highlight vulnerabilities overall. And it, it's got a pretty good asset inventory built in so you can see exactly where these vulnerabilities are in your actual environment. So uh, if you've got a corporate checkbook that is really weighing you down and you want to solve this problem automatically, then you could probably send a bunch of money to those people and they will help you out. All right, so those are great dishes. We need to prepare a meal, though. 
we're gonna work out a menu for tonight's serving and get cooking. So I've read my salsa cookbook and I'm prepping the recipe. Falkio confirms that the recipe really came from me. It gives me a cert. Cosine signs it, Wrecker records it. It goes to my build system with a wolfy base image and the cooks get to work as the Intoto records each step. Protobomb gives me a nice S-bomb in the format of my choice and policy controller inspects each dish and confirms that it meets our high standard before it goes out to the dining room. We've done everything we can to make sure we've produced a quality meal. But in the middle of dinner service, we learned that some of the fresh log for jays that we sourced were contaminated with log for shell. Maybe some of them are really obvious with big crunchy chunks of log for jay, but others are subtle. It's been pureed or it just contains transitive dependency traces of log for jay. That's a big problem. But luckily we have guac. It's ingesting the recall list from OSV, the S bombs from Protobomb, and our build attestations from Intoto. So a few quick commands and a look at its visualizer shows us exactly where the problem is. We slap a new label on the contaminated log for j and we apply the patch, get a fresh batch of our meal. We repeat the process on the last slide and remind policy controller not to let the bad ones with that new guac certificate out. Dinner is saved by the magic of guac and our friends in open source. So bon appetit, I hope this helped a little bit to see what some of the tools are in today's supply chain ecosystem and how they fit together. Once you've had a moment to digest, scan that QR code and let our Mater D know what you thought. Thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference.